Our speaker today, Prabhujika Shudatma Prana, needs very little introduction to many of us here. She is a well-loved friend of our society and has spoken here many times. Prabhujika Shudatma Prana is an ordained nun of the Vedanta Society of Southern California, currently resident at Ridgely Manor in New York. For many years, she's been active in the publication work of the Ramakrishna Order, editing numerous books and articles. She has also written many articles and is the author of two books, The Divine World of the Alvars and Indian Saints and Mystics. The subject of her talk today is The Role of Poetry in Religion. Welcome, Mataji. Om Sahana Bhavatu, Sahano Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karavavahai, Tejasvinavadi Tamastu, Mam Vishavahai. Om Shanti, Shanti. Shanti. <coughs> Om, may Brahman protect us both. May he nourish us both. May we work together with great energy. May our study be vigorous and fruitful. May love and harmony dwell among us. Peace, peace, peace unto all. One of the first things that strikes many Westerners when they read the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna is the great number of songs in the um, book and also the beauty of the songs. Of course, what we read are the poems. We don't get the music with them. But the poems themselves give us so much inspiration and Ramakrishna's teachings become even more alive because of these poems. Though I was long familiar with many of the beautiful songs and hymns of the Christian religion, I had never thought much about the connection between poetry and religion until I started reading the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. According to Joseph Campbell, it's no coincidence that religion inspires the greatest poetry. He once said, the scriptures themselves come from the visions and realizations of poets and artists. Poetry comes from a transcendent source. But Campbell also said that the poets themselves must realize this. Now, poetry has a wonderful ability to draw us within ourselves and uh, help us identify with the ideas that are being conveyed. Moreover, poets know how to play with words and ideas, and they can give shape to ideas that we find hard to express. As Patrick Laude said, according to ancient traditions, the poet is meant to be able to gain access into the deepest layers of reality. By virtue of this ability, the poet was traditionally conceived as a mediator or a channel between the essence of things and the magic of words, crystallizing his perceptions into sounds and images that pierce through the veil of trivial usage and bring miracles out of language. For example, the rishis of the Vedas, and especially of the Rig Veda, gave voice to their wonder and awe at the universe and its gods of water, wind, etc., in verses that still inspire us thousands of years later. These verses are not only beautiful, but also full of great depth and meaning. We can remember here especially the Gayatri verse. It is both beautiful and profound, and it is still recited by thousands, maybe millions of people every day as a mantra for illumination. In fact, the rishis themselves felt that their hymns and prayers had been divinely inspired and had not been composed 
been composed by themselves. This is why the hymns were called Shruti, that which was heard. In the following verse from the Rig Veda, Varana, the god of waters, is addressed as the one supreme being, the supporter of the world, and also as the great poet, Kavi. He who is the supporter of the world of life, who knows the secret mysterious names of the morning beams, he, poet, cherishes manifold farms by his poetic power, even as in heaven. In one of his lectures, Swami Vivekananda also quoted a verse referring to God as the great poet. Swamiji said, I never read of any more beautiful con conception of God than the following. He is the great poet, the ancient poet. The whole universe is his poem coming in verses and rhymes and rhythms written in infinite bliss. And this view of God as the great poet is not confined to India. Elizabeth Barrett Browning said, God himself is the best poet and the real is his song. But on the human level, it takes a truly great poet to be divinely inspired and to hear these great poems. That is to be the transmitter of the divine words of the divine poet. But again, we should note that this is not just an Indian concept. Uh, according to Tilo, Tila Ulbrich, in his translation of Rainer Maria Rilke's first elegy from the Duno Elegies, when Rilke was, was once staying at a castle, Duno near Trieste, he heard the opening lines of what became the first elegy. Those opening lines translated by Ulbrich are, who, if I cried out, would hear me in the ardors of the angels? If an angel heard, and in a sudden movement I were taken to his heart, into the presence of his greater being, would I not be con consumed? For beauty is the beginning of fear, a movement we can hardly bear, and we marvel that it serenely refrains from destroying us. In the rest of the poem, Rilke goes on to ponder what the soul experiences after death. But the real issue for Rilke is not so much what does it mean to be dead, but rather what does it mean to be human? What is this existence that we call life? For thousands of years, poets all over the world have been writing sacred hymns, exploring the nature of the world, the nature of life and death and of the soul, and these are the same themes that poets explore and reflect on today. For instance, how do we express the existential angst that we are all suffering from? The feeling that cries out, who am I? Why am I here? What is all this for? Most of us can't quite put this feeling in words, but when we read a poem that does it and does it beautifully, we invariably say to ourselves, yes, that's it. Take, for example, this poem by Gerald Manley Hopkins. He was a poet who could truly bring miracles out of language. Here the poet is addressing a young child named Margaret who is grieving over nature's signs of the approach of winter. Everything to her looks like it is dying. What does all this mean, she wonders. The poet writes, Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove unleaving? Leaves like the things of man you with your fresh thoughts care for, can you? Ah, as the heart grows older, it will come to such sights colder by and by, nor spare a sigh, though worlds of one would leave me a lie and yet we, you will weep and know why. Now, no matter, child, the name, sorrow's springs are the same. Nor mouth had known, nor mind expressed, what heart heard of, ghost guessed. It is the blight man was born for. It is Margaret you mourn for. Girish ghosts 
also caught this mood beautifully in a song from the drama, The Life of Buddha. It is an adaptation of a song from Sir Edwin Arnold's The Light of Asia. Here the gods and goddesses are addressing Siddhartha, the young prince, pleading with him to renounce the world, to become the Buddha, and fulfill his destiny to save the world. This is an excerpt from that song. We moan for rest, alas, but rest can never find. We know not whence we come, nor where we float away. Time and again we tread this round of smiles and tears. In vain we pine to know whither our pathway leads and why we play this empty play. We sleep although awake as if by a spell bewitched. Will darkness never break into the light of dawn? As restless as the wind, life moves unceasingly. We know not who we are, nor whence it is we come. We know not why we come, nor where it is we drift. Sharp woes dart forth on every side. We know not who we are. So who are we? Where have we come from? Why are we here? These are all questions that hit at the very root of our existence and of our whole idea of what it means to be human. These questions also haunted Hermann Hesse. Like the child in Hopkins' poem, he now and then had a vague feeling of his soul's oneness with everything. But this, this feeling was not enough to give him any answers. It was just something that haunted him. He wrote, Sometimes when a bird calls out, or the wind barrels through the trees, or a dog howls on a farm far away, I stop and listen. My soul turns back again. A thousand forgotten years ago, the bird and the blowing wind were like me. They were my brothers. My soul becomes a tree, an animal, and a cloud. Transform transformed, it comes home as a stranger and questions me. How can I answer? So what is it we are searching for? Why are we here? In Francis Thompson's poem, The Hound of Heaven, a man spends his whole life searching, searching for something to hold on to, something that is really his own. He doesn't know what. Yet everything flies away, and he finally knows why. The Lord wants this man to seek him. Though the poet again and again turns away from God, still the Lord does not give up. Like a bloodhound in hot pursuit of its prey, the Lord does not give up his relentless pursuit of this man. The poet begins, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst, midst of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter, upfisted hopes I sped and shot precipitate adown titanic glooms of chasmed fears. From those hurrying feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. Why was the poet fleeing? <laughs> As he says, for though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore dread, lest having him I must have not beside. <laughs> this is one of those poems that people can easily identify with, for this is our fear also, that the Lord is a jealous lover. He will allow us to have nothing and no one besides him. The poet says, ah, is thy love indeed a weed, albeit an amaranthine weed, suffering no flowers except its own to mount? What kind of love is this, the poet asks. Such is, what is to be? The pulp so bitter, how shall taste the rind? We cannot help but respond to the images this poet conjures up, for somehow we also know in our heart, whether we want to know it or not, what the Lord's reply here is true. Lo, all things fly thee, for thou fliest me. <laughs> At last the divine hound catches his prey, yet it is not death 
the poet finds, but love. The Lord assures him, ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Thou drivest love from thee who drivest me. Again, deep down in our heart, we all know this to be true, that the Lord is the source of all love and that we will find everything in him. Yet still, we go on and on searching outside, searching here and there. There's a prayer that Swami Saprakashananda used to recite. In this world, O Lord, in search of wealth, I have found thee the greatest treasure. In this world, O Lord, in search of a friend, I have found thee the sole dependable one. In this world, O Lord, in search of someone to love, I have found thee the most lovable one. Francis Thompson's poem says the same thing, yet it says it in a very dramatic way, a way that draws us in and makes us identify with it. According to one Indian theory, this ability to draw us in and make us identify with the subject of a poem is called rasa. Rasa literally means taste or flavor. According to Eric Huberman, the scriptures on rasa make the case very strongly that this flavor is transcendent. It is not mundane, but is instead a feeling that is beyond the mundane world. It is the abstraction of a pure feeling which takes you out of space and time and therefore is akin to the realization of Brahman. There are a number of ways the poets use this rasa, and we shall explore some of them here. Let's take, for example, the question of death. This is the basic question we all faced. Who has not wondered, if death truly is the end of everything, then what is the point of this life? Whose heart hasn't cried out from the depths at the thought that our life might be for nothing, that we might be nothing more than glorified clods of dirt born of nature? Here, Giacomo Leopardi curses nature for a fate that demands we suffer not only from the apparent meaninglessness of life, but also from the torment of separation from our loved ones due to death. Dreaded, lamented nature, mother at the birth of every creature, wonder unworthy of our praise, who spawn and nourish just to kill. How can you make such pain in us so needful that one man loving another mortal may survive? But as for nature, whether man fares for better or worse, is least among her cares. Then the question arises, what is death? Religion, in fact, starts with this question, and sometimes it seems our whole life revolves around it. The following two poems explore this question, and surprisingly, they give quite different answers. The first is by Juan Ramon Jimenez. Creator of death, what did you make it with, and why, and where, since it resembles life? How did you join the two into one that are each and both? For uh, we don't know which is life, which is death or where they are, or why, the two of them. In the next poem, The Swan, Rainer Maria Rilke again reflects on the questions of what is life and what is death. Here he compares life in this world to the clumsy movements that a swan makes when he walks on land. Death, on the other hand, is like the graceful movements of the swan in water. It rejoices in the water. Yet even the swan hesitates for a moment before entering the water. This clumsy living that moves lumbering as if in ropes through what is not done reminds us of the awkward way the swan walks. And to die, which is letting go of the ground we stand on and cling to every day, is like the swan when he nervously lets himself down into the water, which receives him gaily and which flows joyfully under and after him, wave after wave, while the swan, unmoving and marvelously calm, is pleased to be carried each minute more fully grown, more like a king, composed farther and farther on. 
two different views of death, and who can say which is right? Each one we can identify with. In another poem, the poet Francisco de Quevedo y Villegas gave, gives us the brutal reminder that, that we are heading towards death from the very beginning of our life. Before we can even take our first step, we are treading the path to death. But the poet says, if death is our destiny, then what is there to lament? Yet still we lament. Everything's stolen away by our brief hours of mortal life, which ridicules all we hold timeless as steel or marble, hard and cold, in the test of time, defeated by its powers. Before our feet can walk, their course must be the road of mortality over which I bring my gloomy life a poor and muddled spring swallowed by the breaking waves of a dark sea. Every short moment is a long step I take along this road, regretting each moment spent as I plod on whether I sleep or wake. But if it's the law and not a punishment, why then lament this brief and final breath, my bitter destined heritage of death? Then there is another big question for we all face. Can we really believe in a God when there is so much suffering in this world? This question of suffering is also very real for us. Sri, Sri Krishna says in the Gita, for the protection of the good and the destruction of evil and for establishing virtue, I embody myself from age to age. Big words. <laughs> but what do we see? <laughs> Often it's just the opposite. The virtuous suffer while the wicked are rewarded. Tagore said it beautifully for us in his poem, This Evil Day. Age after age hast thou, O Lord, sent thy messengers into this pitiless world who have left their word. Forgive all, love all. Cleanse your hearts from the blood-red stains of hatred. Adorable are they, ever to be remembered. Yet from the outer door I have turned them away today, this evil day, with unmeaning salutation. Have I not seen secret malignants strike down the helpless under the cover of hypocritical night? Have I not heard the silenced voice of justice weeping in solitude and at might's defiant outrages? Have I not seen in what agony reckless youth running mad has vainly shattered its life against insensitive rocks? Choked is my voice, mute are my songs today, and darkly my world lies imprisoned in a dismal dream, and I ask thee, O Lord, in tears. Hast thou thyself forgiven? Hast even thou loved those who are poisoning thy air and blotting out thy light? But for most of us, who else is there to go to in times of suffering? Whether we believe in God or not, most of us cannot help but turn to God at such a time. But does he listen to us? When the French poet and existentialist philosopher Jean Wall was imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp, he turned to writing for solace. By the way, Jean Wall was a professor of philosophy at the Sorbonne, and he once flunked Jean-Paul Sartre in philosophy. <laughs> but then they become good friends. <laughs> in this poem, he, Jean Wall employs two voices, one of despair at the beginning and at the end, and the other, a sudden interruption in the middle of knowledge, strength, and awe. My God, you shall not thus forsake me, you the non-existing whom I feel and who, mute, giant, hidden in the world's multitude, whose power is in the fire, the flood, and the sling, our master to whom go insults and pray, prayers, I never needed your, more your help to come, and you were never more deaf and more dumb. <laughs> quite, quite, di quite a difference there. <laughs> By the way, Jean Wall said there are two kinds of existentialist philosophers. 
the theist and the atheist. He and Kierkegaard were the theists. <laughs> I believe Jean-Paul Sartre was an atheist. <laughs> And by the way, the Lord did respond to his prayer, too. It is said that by a series of dangerous underground maneuvers, suspenseful as a spy movie, he escaped and reached the free zone of France with the help of friends. That even though he himself almost sabotaged this rescue <laughs> by mistake. Then again, there is Namovar, who does not hesitate to tell God who is to blame for all this mess. Dwarf, you confuse everyone, but make me understand, becoming oblivion, memory, heat, cold, all things wonderful, and wonder itself, becoming every act of success and every act of good and evil and every consequence, becoming even the weariness of lives, you stand there and what misery you bring. <laughs> so how do we rationalize a benign God in the face of so much suffering? Perhaps no one, not even the poets, can. But sometimes we can turn to the lives of saints and see how they resolve this problem. Tukaram's life was full of suffering. In fact, suffering literally made him sick of the world and forced him to turn to God. Here he says, good for me, God, I'm broke. Good this famine made it worse. Suffering made me think of you, and I vomited this world. Good for me, Lord, my wife's a shrew. Good that I am stripped in public view. I'm blessed that the whole world insults me. Thank you, I've lost all property. How nice it feels to be without shame. What a relief, now I'm all yours. Good that I rebuilt your ruined shrine instead of salvaging my shattered home. Says Tuka, I'm glad I fasted on your day. Starving has kept me stark awake. <laughs> there may be a thank you to God in that, but it doesn't come without a sting. And by the way, we should say, his wife literally rest, uh, almost died trying to save him during his sodomies. <laughs> She risked her life to, to keep him. But then there is Jehuda Halevi, who doesn't care about sorrow or suffering as long as he can hold on to the Lord and his name. May my sweet song be pleasing on thy sight, and the goodness of my praise, O beloved, who art flown afar from me at the evil of my deeds. But I have held fast unto the corner of the garment of love of him who is tremendous and wonderful. Enough for me is the glory of thy name. That is my portion alone from all my labor. Increase the sorrow, I shall love but more, for wonderful is thy love for me. But for those of us who don't have this ideal and who go on fretting and fuming over suffering and death, we have to get many knocks before we finally wake up. Wake up to what? Wake up to the fact that whatever we may think, our life is not really our own. As the poet Hafiz says, Wayfarer, your whole mind and body have been tied to the foot of the divine elephant with a thousand golden chains. Now begin to rain intelligence and compassion upon all your tender wounded cells and realize the profound absurdity of thinking that you can ever go anywhere or do anything without God's will. So finally we come to realize there's no escape for us. The hound of heaven is right on our necks and he brooks no excuses. He doesn't care if we want him or not. We have no choice but to turn to God. Or, perhaps as Hafiz says, we have two choices. You have been invited to meet the friend. No one can resist a divine invitation. That narrows down all our choices to just two. We can come to God dressed for dancing or be carried on a stretcher to God's ward. <laughs> 
So we can come to him willingly or not, now or later, but come we must. <laughs> so what happens when we accept this invitation? Like the subject of Francis Thompson's poem, we suddenly awaken to an understanding that God really is the source of all love. It is God whom we've been seeking all along, seeking here and there. Again, Hoffa says, what happens when your soul begins to awaken your eyes and your heart and the cells of your body to the great journey of love? First, there is wonderful laughter and probably precious tears and a hundred sweet promises no one can ever keep. But still, God is delighted and amused you once tried to be a saint. What happens when your soul begins to awaken this world to our deep need to love and serve the friend? Oh, the beloved will send you one of his wonderful wild companions, like Hafiz. Now we feel a strange wonder and awe, as Hafiz says. We have discovered God's love. Is lo such love possible, we wonder? And now we have awakened to a new vision of life. Everything about this life that seemed so important before, even suffering and death, everything begins to fade into insignificance. Everything, in fact, is forgotten in our newfound love for God. Like Monica, Monica Vachikar, the devotee exclaims in astonishment, Yourself you gave to me. Me you took to yourself. Oh, Shankara, who, inde who indeed is wiser? I gained endless bliss. What gains you from me? <laughs> So far, we have talked about identifying with poems in a serious but detached way. We see the poems as expressing ideas that are in our heart, which we have not found words for, or as feelings that we believe come from God himself. But there is a different kind of identification that also goes on subtly, with, subtly within us when we read these poems. It is so subtle that first we don't even realize what is happening. As we read or sing these poems, we gradually begin to internalize the ideas in them. More and more we begin to visualize God as having the qualities that the poets describe. Thus we find that the purpose of singing or reading these poems is to create a meditative, ex a meditative mood. But we should also keep in mind that the writers of these songs are very often communicating through poetry what they themselves have seen or experienced in meditation. Thus, as D.L. Haberman says, poetry is used both to express the meditative experience and to evoke the meditative experience. Sometimes poets describe the physical attributes of the Lord whom they have seen in a vision. It is their descriptions then that give others something to meditate on. Here, Akka Mahadevi describes her vision of Shiva, whom she refers to as Chennamalakarjuna. I have seen him in his divine form, him with the matted locks, him with a jeweled crown, him with the gleaming teeth, him with a smiling face him who illumines the 14 worlds with the light of his eyes. I have seen him, and the thirst of my eyes is quenched. I have seen the great Lord, whom the men among men serve but as wives. I have seen the supreme guru, Chenna Malakarjuna, sporting with the primeval Shakti, and saved am I. But then the poets in their meditation might also witness the Lord's play. They see in meditation the Lord playing with his friends and companions, and again they describe what they see. For example, as many of us know, Yashoda and Nanda are said to be Krishna's parents, but according to the Puranas, they are really his foster parents. His actual parents, uh, Devaki and Vasudeva, who were in uh, who were imprisoned in a dungeon, and his ex parents were Devaki and not Vasudeva, who were imprisoned in a uh, dungeon in Mothra. Here in this song, as, Christ, as Krishna is still a little child, Yashoda doesn't want him to know this. 
but Krishna's elder brother, Balaram, loves to tease Krishna. Here in this scene by Suradas, Krishna comes running to Yashoda in tears. Mother, brother's always teasing me. He says, Yashoda bought you. Who says she gave you birth? What can I do? I'm so mad I can't go out and play. Again and again he asks, who's your mother? Who's your father? White is Nanda. Who and Yashoda white? How come you're so black? The other boys all snap their fingers and laugh to see me dance. You sure know how to beat me, but you never get mad at brother. <laughs> Yashoda heard Mohan's angry words and was amused. Listen, Kanhai, your brother's a liar. He's a scoundrel from birth. I swear by the cows we live by. I am your mother. You are my son. <laughs> so here Swordas transports us to another world, giving us a glimpse of the Lord's play. And he has also giving a, given us a feeling for some issues and emotions in that play. Thus, in this scene, we are, as Kenneth Bryant says, the privileged spectators. We know more about the characters and their fate than, the, than do the characters themselves. <laughs> Again, some poems may also evoke a mood that enables us to respond directly to God ourselves, that is, to feel a relationship with God. As Kenneth Bryant said, it is not so much what the poet says, for that we may see in the poems themselves, but how he says what he does, how the poems employ the tools of language, myth, and conventions to move their audience to feel and think in certain ways. Now suppose we read a poem like the following by Surdas. Yashoda delights in watching him walk, clumping along on faltering feet, showing off when he sees his mother. He walks as far as the doorstep, but returns again and again, stumbles and falls, but can't quite cross. And the gods are made to wonder, for he makes in a second a million worlds and destroys in a second a million more. Yet he sits on the lap of the cowherd's wife as she teaches him to play, and she leads him by the hand across that doorstep, step by step by step. The sight of the Lord of Sur stuns the minds of gods and men. So here the poet not only lets us watch with him how Krishna learns to walk, but also lets us feel with his mother Yashoda her motherly love and affection for her child. In fact, we are drawn into her love through this poem. We start identifying with it. In India, this relationship with God is called Vatsalya Bhava. It is the parental attitude towards God. Where there is no fear or awe, God is simply a child. Now suppose this relationship towards God appeals to us. By meditating on a poem like this, we can easily increase our own love and devotion and develop a similar relationship with God. But this is not the end. In the previous poem, the, the poet was still an outsider. He was not really a part of the play. But Surdas was not satisfied with that. He wanted to interact himself directly with God and not just be a witness. So this is what he did. Wake up, wake up, Gopal. Child, you mustn't sleep so much. Morning's the best part of the day. All the little boys in the village come by to see you and then leave like a string of black bees all waiting for a lotus bud to bloom. If you don't believe me, Sores Lard, my little black tamala tree, then just wake up and open your eye and come and see for yourself. <laughs> so, here, a shift has taken place. The poet is now taking the part of Yashoda and has fully identified himself and his relationship with God. His relationship has come to full fruition, as it is a direct relationship with God. There's no intermediary. Now, here's another mood, quite an interesting mood. It's not one that the Gorya Vaishnavas might accept, but it works. And that is the dog bhava. Like Tukaram, you could have a great time with this one. This relationship is actually quite appropriate for just as one cannot explain the love between a dog and its master, so also one cannot explain the love between a devotee and God. This is just one of Tukaram's dog bhava songs. 
like a dog lying at your door. Hurry, hurry, I bark your name. I bark, I get up, I sit down again, but never, O oh Gopal, would I leave your feet. Says Tuka, I know my master's weakness. He just loves to fondle his pet. <laughs> So entering the Lord's Leela and having a direct relationship with God is a deeper form of identification, even if it is as a dog. And as we, the reader of the poems, meditate on the poems and the poet's identification, we also can feel that same identification. How deeply does the poet identify with God? That's the question. How deeply do we identify with the poem and the poet's identification? But here again, this is not just an Indian concept. Let's look at this poem by Rainer Marie Rilke. Is it possible for us to feel Mary's suffering when she saw her son killed on the cross? Rilke felt it and identified with it and put it in these words of Mary. I believe this poem is Rilke's meditation on the Pieta by either Rodin or Michelangelo. Now is my misery full. Unutterably it fills me. I am numb, as stone is numb inside. Hard as I am, only one thing I know. You grew and grew, as if on purpose to stand forth as agony too vast for my heart to seize and hold. Now you lie across my lap. Now I can no more give birth to you. Yet there's still a, another and deeper identification. When the love between God and his lover becomes deeper and deeper, the two become united. This is a mysterious union, and the poets speak of it only in mysterious ways. This is how the mystic Ahalaj describes it. Betwixt me and thee there lingers, and it is I that torments me. Uh, of thy grace, take this I from between us. I am he whom I love, and he whom I love is I. We are two spirits dwelling in one body. If thou seest me, thou seest him. If thou seest him, thou seest us both. In Namavar's description of this union, he is both either consumed by the Lord or possessed by the Lord, or both. Poets beware, your life is in danger. The Lord of Gardens is a thief, a cheat, a master of illusions. He came to me, a wizard with a word, sneaked into my body, my breath, with bystanders looking on but seeing nothing. He consumed me, life and limb, and filled me, made me over into himself. Again, this union is frequently compared to the union and separation between lovers, as in this poem by Mirabai. He's bound my heart with the powers he owns, mother, he with the lotus eyes. Arrows like spears, this body is pierced, and mother, he's gone far away. When did it happen, mother? I don't know, but now it's too much to bear. Talismans, spells, medicines, I've tried, but the pain won't go. Is there someone who can bring relief? Mother, the hurt is cruel. Here I am, near, and you're not far. Hurry to meet, to meet Mira's mountain lifter, Lord. Have mercy, cool this body's fire. Lotus eyes with the powers you've owned, with those powers you've bound. So at this stage, we've come to the ecstasy of God's love. The poets go mad with this love. They realize that love itself is God. The soul now knows nothing but God and that love, and it cannot contain its joy. As Hafez says, I am happy even before I have a reason. I am full of light even before the sky can greet the sun or the moon. Dear companions, we have been in love with God for so very, very long. What can Hafez now do but forever dance? But what if a poet or devotee does not believe in or is not interested in an anthropomorphic view of God? 
remember Ramakrishna says that God is both with form and without form, with qualities and without qualities. But as far as God without form goes, poets have also been writing hymns of praise on this aspect for thousands of years. Such as the hallowed be Brahman, the absolute, the infinite, the fathomless, higher than the highest, deeper than the deepest, Thou art the light of truth, the fount of love, the home of bliss. This universe with all its manifold and blessed modes is but the enchanting poem of thine inexhaustible thought. Its beauty overflows on every side. Now, if it's a matter of identifying with the subject of a poem, it would seem that poems on the formless uh, would be easier to identify with as in reality, this is our fundament, fundamental identity. But somehow, these poems are not. But do we find in sub, such poems a shift in consciousness as we did in the others where the poet shows us his direct experience? The previous poem describes something of the absolute in an indirect way with qualities. The following poem by Swami Vivekananda, A Song on Samadhi, gives us probably the closest thing we can get to a direct description, a shift in consciousness. Lo, the sun is not, nor the comely moon, all light extinct. In the great void of space floats shadow-like the image universe. In the void of mind involute there floats the fleeting universe, rises and floats, sinks again, ceaseless in the current eye. Slowly, slowly, the, the shadow multitude entered the primal womb and flowed ceaseless, the only current, the I am, I am. Lo, tis stopped, even that current flows no more. Void merged into void, beyond speech and mind, whose heart understands, he verily does. So this is the ultimate identification, the highest. Or is it? We see the poets are still not done. Is their experience beyond this last one of total oneness with the absolute? Ramakrishna seems to indicate that it is. He calls, the experience, he calls it the experience of the vigyani, that is, the experience of seeing God everywhere in everything. And this is not the kind of haunting feeling that Hermann Hesse described, but it is an actual vision, a direct realization. As the poet Jafar says, I have joined my heart to thee, all that exists art thou. Thee only have I found, for thou art all that exists. O Lord, beloved of my heart, thou art the home of all. Where indeed is the heart in which thou dost not dwell? Thou hast entered every heart, all that exists art thou. Whether sage or fool, whether Hindu or Muslim, thou makest them as thou wilt, all, this, all that exists art thou. Hafiz also described this experience in his unique way. Start seeing everything as God, but keep it a secret. Become like a man who is awestruck and nourished, listening to a golden nightingale sing in a beautiful foreign language while God invisibly nests on its tongue. Ha Hafiz, who can you tell in this world that when a dog runs up to you wagging its ecstatic tail, you lean down and whisper in its ear, Beloved, I am so glad you are happy to see me. Beloved, I am so glad, so very glad you have come. So have all these poets had an experience of God? Perhaps not all of them, maybe not in the strictest sense of the term, but how did they do it? In the Gita, Sri Krishna explained that whenever we find a person who is endowed with a special gift or strength, we should know that this gift has originated from a portion of the Lord's power. So these poor poets have received, for whatever reason, a special power or gift from God himself. As mentioned before, Joseph Campbell also said that real poetry comes from a transcendent source, yet the poet must realize this and be humble before this knowledge. Tukaram verifies this in several of his poems, such as the following. 
He who speaks these poems through me is the only one who knows how they were made. Don't ask me, I only carry them like his own load and beg for bread when I'm hungry. He gave me the measure, I just dole out his stuff when he asks me. I'm only the helper, he's the boss. I'm his empty measure, filled with his grain, emptied by his ardor. Says Tuca, Vital is the one who takes the words out of my mouth. So the role of poetry in religion is to help us give, help give us an identity, our a true identity in God. As it is said in a verse, what we identify with is what we become. And if we can identify, identify strongly enough with one such poem, who knows then what we might become? We might even become like Jalaluddin Rumi, who says, I am dust particles in sunlight. I am the round sun. To the dust particles, I say, stay. To the sun, keep moving. I am morning mist and the breathing of evening. I am wind on the top of a grove and surf on the cliff. Mast, rudder, helmsman, and keel, I am also the coral reef they found her on. I am a tree with a trained parrot in its branches, silence, thought, and voice. The musical air coming through a flute, a spark of a stone, a flickering in metal, both candle and the moth crazy around it, rose and the nightingale lost in the fragrance. I am all orders of being, the circling galaxy, the evolutionary intelligence, the lift and the falling away, what is and what isn't. You who know Jalaluddin, you the one and all, say who I am, say I am you. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Just oh. here. Do you want me to move the chair? No, no, that's okay. I can stand. I can stand. <laughs> that's all right. I forgot. Questions. Okay. Oh, here is one. Okay. okay. Hi. Um, as you were saying some things, I've noted some down, uh, things down, and I think in the beginning you uh, mentioned about um, though we know death is destiny, uh, um, we still lament. Like one of the poets was oh, saying that is about death. Yes. Uh -huh. I I had like maybe it's a rhetorical question I'm unsure but I think maybe we lament though all of us know that we're all gonna die we lament because it's not actual experience but it's just a fact we know and it's not a wisdom and uh, it's maybe a transition from the unknown to the known like how would you, I mean, we all know this, but why do we still experience that? Because it, it's so unknown. We don't know what happens. Like uh, those two poets, Juan Ramon Jimenez said, oh, they're the same, y you know, life and death, you know, what's the difference? You know, that's what he was saying. But Rilke was saying, wow, how clumsy it is moving around in this world. But when we die, oh, how graceful and peaceful and beautiful it is. <laughs> Everybody has their own ideas, but we don't know. <laughs> so. And a follow-up question for that is, are we supposed to actually envision a life without any lament, like you were saying, there's the concept of rasa, right? There are different tastes and uh, experiences and emotions in life. 
So do we aim to not have that layman or do we just embrace the layman in our life to accept Embrace the what? I'm sure. I'm the layman, the, the suffering. La oh, lament. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, the lament. To, um, do we just embrace it or do we just come to a place where there is no lament anymore? I think it, it, this is what our spiritual practices are for. When we really truly uh, do our spiritual practices and, and get some experience, then we know there's no death. I mean, death is just the death of the body. And so this is what our spiritual practices are for. And this is what these po poets are taking us through that uh, taking us through this, what is God, who is God, what, what is he doing for us, what, what can we do to get to everything, every step we take is to get to him, really. And so uh, when we really have some kind of experience that we're not the body, we're not the mind either, uh, that we can have this peace. There's no lament then. Then we have this peace of knowing that the ultimate, as Rumi is saying, the ultimate is realizing that we are one with everything. We are, part, we are one with God, with Brahman. This is an awe. And so what is there? If the body drops, the body drops. But there's nothing, nothing for us to lament. And yeah. Thank you. I, that answered my question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sister, you were uh, reading some poems where um, the they. People develop relationship, different relationships with God, and Ramakrishna always says we have to develop a relationship. <laughs> but how do we find that relationship? Do we grow different stages, or does it just develop that it, one suits us? It, it gradually develops within you as as you. But you know, you can experiment. Ramakrishna didn't say. Uh, Oh, you have to wait until you know what it is, until that seed of your devotion grows. He, he didn't say that. So, I, you know, if I like to experiment with them, I like them all myself. <laughs> so, you know, take one that you feel that you're that you like. If it's whether being a mother of God or a dog. <laughs> Swami Shivananda used to say, say uh, he had a dog named Kalo, and he said, Kalo is my dog. I am Ramakrishna's dog. <laughs> so, you know, whatever, you know, just experiment, you know, just give it a try, kind of meditate on it or think of it during the day while you're working and stuff. Just. You know, it really, it has a lot of benefits to it because that way you feel kind of a commitment to the Lord. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm your child and you're my pa parent. And um, so you have to take care of me. Or, you know, I'm your, uh, I'm your dog. I'm looking after you, you know, <laughs> like that. So it has a lot of benefits too. And, you know, really and truly, Whoever we love in this world, we have a relationship with. We love, you know, our parents because they're parents. Nobody has to tell us to to uh, love our parents or have a relationship with them. And so, you know, if we kind of think of it in that way, I really love God. Now, you know, I want, you know, I have some relationship with Him, and um, so if we think of it that way, then then just we can find something more easily then. But you can always experiment. <laughs> you know, we, we say we can humanize our relationship. 
relationship with God and humanize our relationship with other humans. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Okay, sure. Om Purnamata Purnamidang Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vishishate Om Shanti 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 Om That Brahman is infinite. The inf this universe is infinite. The infinite proceeds from the infinite. Taking the infinite from the infinite, it remains as infinite alone. Peace, peace, peace unto all.